Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. Good morning, Wildwood. My name is Brian Smith, one of the elders here, the lead pastor. Turn your uh, Bible to Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. While I ask you, have you ever been um, privy to, witness to, or experienced the beauty bias? The beauty bias. Maybe you're not quite familiar with the, view, the beauty bias. Maybe, though, you've been the unwitting recipient, benefactor of the beauty bias, or perhaps you've been a victim of it, knowingly or not. The beauty bias is the bias that people generally have toward beautiful things. Generally speaking, people want to look at and surround themselves with beautiful things and beautiful people. Uh, For instance, I don't know many people that plan romantic getaways to the garbage dump. (laughs) But the mountains, right? In a similar way, and perhaps because of our fallen nature, uh, we are prone to give preferential treatment to people who are beautiful. We like to look at beautiful things. The Lord has created beautiful things. But in our fallen nature, we are prone to give preference to people who, by according to whatever standards our culture determines to be beautiful, are more beautiful. And to give less preference uh, to, to those people that are deemed less beautiful. And because that's the sort of the natural inclination of people, those that are constantly the recipient of the beauty bias learn growing up that they don't have to work quite as hard. And so sometimes, not all beautiful people, but sometimes it can be tempting to sort of presume upon some innate quality or some credential that you have to sort of skate by. In one of my army classes on leadership, I was talking about paradigm shifts, and I used a scene from a movie that I've never actually watched the whole thing. It's called The Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> you ever seen that movie? Uh, if you're a guy and you, you don't need to answer that question. <laughs> uh, I, need to state, I need to set the record. I have not watched the whole movie. Uh, I saw this clip. This, this clip was provided for me, and, uh, and so I used the clip. Uh, but in this clip, Andrea, who is kind of the, 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 uh, the co-star, um, she's the assistant to uh, 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 Miranda. Miranda's the devil who wears Prada, and so Andrea is the assistant, and she, she's sort of uh, slacking in her job. She, she's not performing according to how Miranda wants her to perform, and she's called to the carpet, and Miranda just, man, knocks her down. I mean, it's vicious in this scene. And Andrea has essentially been relying upon her good looks and her charisma to kind of get her up to this point in life, to kind of skate through life without really having to try all that hard. That was her paradigm. She's just going to naturally going to be accepted and promoted, and and people are going to fawn over her until, until Miranda didn't, and just brought her way down. And so it leaves her uh, sulking, and, and she runs to her friend Nigel uh, looking for consolation, and Nigel speaks truth and love and says, because here, and he's talking about where they work, because here where most people would die to work, you only deign to work. Now, I had to look up that word deign, D-E-I-G-N, I think, uh, it means to, to treat something as if it's below your dignity. So most people, Andrea, would die to be in your shoes, and, and you act as if this is beneath you. And so he calls her bluff. He, he challenges her to check your heart. Are you just presuming upon some credentials that have worked for you up to this point? Or are you really a sincere employee of Miranda Priestley? 
Are you really trying? Are you, are, are you sincere in your employment here? Is your commitment solid? In a similar way, Paul sort of calls the bluff of the Roman church. The paradigm for Andrea was, what has worked for me thus far is going to always work for me. Because people have deferred to me because of my beauty, because of my smarts, because of my charisma, whatever credentials she had, because people are, 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 are preferencing, are, are giving me preference, they're showing me partiality, that, that will always work in my life. And, and Paul is calling the church's bluff because the Jews expected that God would be partial to them. The word partial in its original form has to do with being swayed by a person's face. Looking at a person's face and giving some kind of preferential treatment. And so the Jews expected that God would look upon their face and give them preferential treatment. It was widely expected that the Jews would just sort of skate by through life and skate through judgment based simply on their religious heritage. And they even brought this into the church at Rome. And so Paul is going to work at that the way Miranda worked at that with Andrea and bringing these people, these, these Jewish converts, I hesitate to call them Christian, I don't know that they were Christian, but they were Jewish converts, bringing them to an end of themselves so that they would no longer rely upon their own credentials, their own religious credentials, and stop presuming that the Lord is going to give preferential treatment to them based simply upon their heritage and their achievements. So let's read Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. He will render to each according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you have leveled the playing field for Jews and Gentiles. I pray, Lord, that you would soften our hearts and help us to hear. Lord, help us to check our hearts. Lord, help us to call out for your grace. Help us to hope in nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. In his name I pray, amen. Now, it's possible that you and I might imagine that there is something intrinsic in us that would cause God to show us partiality. I wonder how many Americans believe that God is going to look favorably upon us just by virtue of the fact that we're Americans. That, that, that Americans are virtuous, that other nations and nationalities are not but Americans are virtuous, and so surely God will show partiality to me. Or perhaps it's the theological knowledge that you bear. I know so much. I've memorized Scripture. I've been so faithful to go through the Bible studies. And I read every day, and I know so much. Or maybe I'm a consummate servant to the church and to the Lord and surely God will show preference to me. But Kent Hughes warns us, apart from the blood of Christ, God is not moved. Apart from the blood of Christ, God is not moved. 
This is Paul's point in today's passage. He says in verse 6, he will render to each one according to his works. Now, you may not realize this, but God's judgment of people according to their works is a theme found throughout the Old Testament, as well as in Paul's and Peter's letters, as well as in Revelation from the words of Jesus. God is going to render to each person according to what he's done. Let's take a look at a few verses here. For according to the work of man, he will repay him. Job 34, 11. And will he not repay man according to his work? Proverbs 24, 12. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, 1 Peter 1, 17. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Revelation, 20, uh, Revelation 2, 23, that's the words of Jesus. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Revelation 20, verse 12. Now, judgment according to works is different from salvation by works. Judgment according to works is right because words and deeds follow heart commitments. It's easy to say, I believe, but the declaration of faith that counts is the one that is followed by action, James tells us. Many Jews boasted in the law. In the next couple of passages, we're going to see that Paul says, you boast in the law. You Jews boast in the law. They prided themselves in knowledge, in theology, but they were not obedient to it. They acknowledged that what it says is right, but they didn't live by it. Instead, they sat in judgment, Paul says. They judged other people for doing things that they did the same. He says, do you think that you're going to escape judgment? Their knowledge of the Word, the knowledge of what was right, that the, the knowledge that gave them the basis to judge other people did not impact their own hearts. It did nothing to change their affection toward our God. Suppose that there is a person who says to you, I'm your friend. I'm your best friend. But you call them in your time of need. And they say, I have no time for you. You call and say, hey, let's, let's just hang out. Let's spend time together. No, thank you. They betray you. They throw you under the bus at the first opportunity. My question for you is, is that a friend? No. We, we know that. But I'm your best friend. I post about it on Facebook all the time. My, my good buddy, my friend, I need you. I, I want to spend time with you. No. Is it really a friend? No. We know that. We know that there is more than just a statement. No. What we really believe in our hearts is reflected by what we do in our lives. Amen? The Jews boasted in the law. They boasted that they were close to God, were friends of God. And they hung Jesus on the cross. Paul, Paul says not much has changed in the, in the 20 years between that day and, and, and when he's writing to the church in Rome built or, or, or based, uh, comprised mostly of Jewish converts. He, he, he is he is chopping at the tree of pride, of spiritual pride, of presumption. He continues in verse 7. Those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. So unlike those who, in verse 8, which we'll see in just a second, are self-seeking, there is a seeking 
that leads to eternal life. Do you see that? Those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. There's a seeking that leads to eternal life with hearts set on heaven and the God of heaven. It's not enough to just want heaven, though. Paul says it is seeking with patience in well-doing that counts. There's wanting and there's well-doing. Now, that word, that phrase, by patience in well-doing, implies a consistent doing of things that are right and good. That's what it means by well-doing. That you're consistently, persistently doing what's right. Those who in patience or by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Isn't that what we seek? Don't we want eternal life? By patience and well-doing. We're going to be judged not according to what we know. And this might be a shock to people. We're going to be judged not according to what we know. There's not going to be a Bible trivia contest. And the people that win pass on to the next round. Right? I'm sorry, there's no, there's no Bible B. How many of you, you know, when you were a kid, you were like the champ at finding the books of the Bible? You know? Yeah, right? That's right. Okay, but there's, you're not going to be judged based on what you know, your smarts or the, your theological education. No, it's what do you do. When we seek sincerely, it's going to be reflected in what we do. Not just what we know, but when we seek sincerely, it's going to be reflected in how we live our lives. By patience in well-doing. However, in verse 8, Paul says, but for those who are self-seeking, see the contrast? Two types of seeking. Seeking the glory and honor and immortality. Those who are self-seeking, which implies that whose glory and honor are we seeking? In verse 7, not ours. The Lord's glory. Because it's opposite. So those who are self-seeking seeking their own glory, their own honor, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Those who are self-seeking do not obey the truth. Instead, they obey unrighteousness. They don't follow God, but rather they follow evil. Just like the Gentile world, they've exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. Except here Paul is implying that even though they don't worship gold and silver and wooden sculptures, they're no less guilty of idolatry. It's just that the image of man that they worship is the one that they see in the mirror. They worship themselves. Now, I want you to consider the indictment that began Romans 1, 18 through 32. That, that, is the, that is the indictment on the wicked world out there. Romans 1, 18 through 32. All the people in the church are nodding their heads. Yeah, Paul, preach it. Come on, God, go get them. Nasty Sinful people, what was the indictment? How did the indictment begin against the wicked, wicked world? By their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. Now, what does Paul say in verse 8? Those who are self seeking do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. These people in the church who are nodding along in affirmation, God deserves to, to destroy the world. They're nodding along in affirmation. Paul says, you are in the same camp. God's wrath will be inflicted upon 
you too. Why? Rejection of the truth, embrace of unrighteousness. Do you see this? You see what Paul is trying to do here? He hooks them by saying, oh, the, the bad people out there, they, they suppress the truth because of their unrighteousness. And now you good people in here, you disobey truth, and instead you obey righteousness. Oh, thank the Lord that Paul didn't write Romans to us. Amen? They rejected the Creator, and instead they worship creation, listen, just like the world. Paul says, for them there will be wrath and fury. He's moved beyond speaking to the wicked world. He's even moved beyond his diatribe. Remember last week I, 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 I introduced you to diatribe, the rhetorical device where a narrator or a speaker or an instructor chooses a hypothetical, imaginary cynic or critic or opponent, and then they have this imaginary dialogue so that the audience gets to hear and, and possibly think, ah, maybe that's speaking to me, without Paul directly pointing the finger. He's moved beyond the diatribe with his second-person uh, pronouns, you, and now he, it's a warning. Now he's addressing, now he's bringing this home to anyone who has an ear to hear. It's a warning to everyone. I want you to imagine being one of those Roman religious hypocrites, believing that you're living such a clean and moral life, only to find out that God sees your life as self-seeking and unrighteous disobedience. Rather than preparing for you a weight of glory in heaven, this lifestyle is preparing for you God's wrath and fury. Right? Amen. Thanks, thanks Paul, for not writing that to us. Right? Can you imagine being in that, in, in that category? Uh, uh, of finding out that the Lord looks at your life so clean and so moral, and He judges that life to be unrighteous? It's no wonder that Paul continues in verse 9. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. Hell will be eternal tribulation and distress. The reality is that you will live forever in one of two places, in God's presence in heaven or outside of His presence in a real place called hell. You will live forever, and Paul describes hell as a place of tribulation and distress. R.C. Sproul comments, God is not just angry with our sin, He is indignant. I'm afraid that many people in the church Imagine that, that God is, alike, uh, uh, is a lot like your accommodating grandma or grandpa. Not the strict one. Not the one that sent you out to get the branch off the tree. Not that one, the other one. The one that just laughs at your sin. The one that just chuckles at your, uh, at, at, at your bad behavior and bad attitude and gives you cookies and milk to make you feel better because you must just be hungry or grumpy. We imagine that God is a lot like that. R.C. Sproul tells us that God is not just angry, he's indignant with your sin. Perhaps no scripture more clearly articulates God's indignation than 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-9, also written by Paul who wrote Romans. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, there will, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. I've said many, many times, 
I campaigned on this. I came to you preaching this in my candidating weekend, the most terrifying verse or passage in all of Scripture is Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, where Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, gentle and lowly, says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Church, we need to reckon with this reality. This ought to be a come to Jesus moment for us. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not describing the judgment of people out there, the wicked world out there. And nor is Paul describing the world out there in Romans 2. He did that in Romans 1, 18-32. Now he's talking about those who occupy seats within the church, just as Jesus These are people who have committed their life to serving in the name of the Lord. This is not just religious people. This is people who say, in your name, we prophesied and cast out demons and did many mighty works in the name of Jesus. In Romans 2, Paul is writing to people in the church who consider themselves guides to the blind. Come, we'll help you. We'll help you find God. We'll help you to the path. And Paul tells them in verse uh, verse 19 that they are blind themselves. Imagine the tragedy of this. They think they're helping people find God. They think they're helping people on the path of salvation. And Paul says, you are blind. They thought they were headed for heaven, and instead they're headed for tribulation and distress. Praise the Lord. Paul continues, verse 10. There's going to be distress for those who do evil and seek self rather than God's glory. But Paul assures us in verse 10 that there is glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. So both the reward, do you notice here? You see it twice, both the reward for those who do well and the wrath for those who do evil is first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Everyone who seeks the glory of God will find glory, His glory. They'll enter into glory. Everyone who seeks His honor will find His honor. Everyone who seeks immortality will find peace. Okay, Paul, what are you you saying here? Why immortality to peace? Glory to glory, honor to honor, immortality to peace. Here's why. Because eternal life, which is this, this is summarizing, is not just never dying. If God had just not kicked Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, we would never die. It's not just about restoring quantity of life. It is about restoring quality of life, restoring what was broken in the Garden of Eden at the fall, which was what? Peace with God. You want eternal life? You're seeking eternal life? What you are ultimately, fundamentally seeking is unending, undisturbed peace with God. And those who seek for God's glory, and those who seek for His honor, and those who seek for immortality will be given eternal life, and you will be at peace with God. 
the Jews expected peace with God based simply on the fact that they were Jews. Based simply on the fact that they could trace their lineage. If anyone could appeal to family heritage, it was the Jews. Descendants of Father Abraham. The the covenant that God made with Abraham to bless the nations. They could. And they expected that, but that could not be further from the truth. Paul says in verse 11, For God shows no partiality. God is not partial to bribes. Let's look at here. Let's look at what the Bible says about God's impartiality. God is not partial to bribes. Deuteronomy 10, 17, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. So if you thought you were going to bribe God with all your wealth, okay, giving to the church, that's, that's what's going to get me by. I'll give to the church. I'll, I'll be benevolent. I'll be philanthropic. I'll support ministries. God is not partial to bribes. He's not partial to royalty or riches, Job 34, 19, who shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich more than the poor. If you thought that because you are wealthy, God must be favorable to you, that that your wealth or your affluence or your comfort in life must be evidence that God is pleased with you, false. Maybe God has blessed you, but that is not a necessary an indicator of your status with the Lord. God is not partial regarding nationality. I'm sorry to say that Americans will not receive God's preferential treatment because we are Americans. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. I'm sorry to us Americans or Westerners, God is not looking upon us favorably because of our nationality. He's not partial regarding position of authority. Paul said in Galatians 2.6, speaking of those in church authority, he said, and from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. It doesn't matter what standing you have in the church or in civil governance or in some club somewhere. God is not partial to you because of your authority or your influence over other people. God is not partial to slave or to free. Paul said in Ephesians 6, 9, Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality in him. Whether you are slave or free, whether you are privileged or unprivileged, whether you have it all or have nothing at all, God is not partial to you. The only thing that counts is that you are seeking God's glory and honor and immortality. So don't presume upon the Lord thinking that He's going to let you skate by. That you're going to smile at God. Your smile has worked. It it, it woos everyone else. Your knowledge impresses everyone else. Your stature impresses everyone else. You're used to getting your way. Don't presume that you're going to get your way with God. When you seek God's glory and honor wholeheartedly, you're going to get it. You're going to get what you seek. But here's the problem. Hopefully there's been a bit of a, of a hitch in your spirit the whole sermon. Hopefully there's been, a, like, is this right? Like, something's off with this. Something doesn't, 
resonate with my spirit. Here's the problem. You get what you seek. You seek God's glory and honor and immortality with all your heart by patience in well-doing, consistently, persistently doing the right thing. You're going to get it. But here's the problem. And this is fundamentally Paul's point in Romans 1 and Romans 2. No one seeks for God. Romans 1 and Romans 2 is all leading up to Romans 3. No one seeks for God. No one has ever sought for God. This leads us up to chapter 3 where Paul says in verse 9 and in verse 20, he says, we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. That is the point of, of Romans chapter 2. Right? If Romans chapter 1 is about the wicked world and they deserve judgment, Romans 2 is about the religious hypocrite who deserves judgment. Because no one seeks for God. All are under sin. Jews and Greeks and then he makes his thesis, for by works of the law, in other words, by, patient well, by, by patience in well-doing, no one, no human being will be justified in his sight. Not a person alive except Christ, who will be the judge. So no one will, no person that's ever lived is going to stand before Jesus and say, by patience in well-doing, I have sought you with all my heart, and I deserve to be justified before you. No one. Neither Jews nor Greeks. The fact is, we will all be judged by Christ, and He will reveal the truth of our hearts on that day. The things that you are trying to hide right now, the things that you are, are, are trying to console your mind with right now, they will be revealed. The, tr the motives, the attitudes, the thoughts, the words done in secret, the dark places will all be exposed, will all be revealed, and it is essential that when we are laid bare before the Lord, that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. On that day, when you are bare before the Lord, you want to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. For as God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, our good deeds are as filthy rags. And I won't get too graphic, but doesn't just mean oily stained cloths. I can assure you that you don't want to be clothed in filthy rags of your good deeds on that day. Those who recognize their hopeless estate, that's Paul's point, and that is my point, church. I am not trying to hurt your feelings. I am not trying to be unkind to you. I am trying to do what Paul was trying to do in Romans chapter 2 and cause these people to realize, to come to grips with their utterly hopeless estate. They could appeal to morality. They could appeal to heritage. They could appeal to commitment. They were probably members of the church. They were probably generous to the church. But it's not until they recognize their hopeless estate and call out to Christ for forgiveness that they would be covered by His righteousness. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, Paul says in Romans chapter 3. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for who? For all who believe. For all who believe, none of you will stand on your own merits. 
But any of you and every one of you in here or watching online who call out to Jesus will be covered by his righteousness. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Why would Paul feel compelled to, to, to spend all of chapter 2 chopping down at the tree of religious credentials so that he could bring people to a place where they would recognize, I need Jesus. God is not going to smile at me because of my face. God's not going to smile at me because of my nationality. God is not going to smile at me because of my wealth. He's not going to smile at me because of what I did in the church. He's not going to smile at me because I cast out demons in his name. He's going to smile at me because I'm clothed in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? This is why Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. To those who were raised close to God and those who were not. To those who can't even remember a day in their life that they were not meaningfully part of a Bible-preaching church and those who will never in their entire life step foot in one. To those who can't remember parents ever failing to pray with them, to read the Bible to them, every story of the Bible, and those whose parents curse God every single day. To those whose youth was marked by service projects and mission trips, and those whose youth was marked by drugs and sex and alcohol. To those who's, who would struggle to identify with the adulterous woman. And those who know exactly how she felt. To those who know the Bible inside and out and those who would rather throw it out. The gospel is the power of salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek, and nothing else works. Amen? As we turn our attention now to communion, I ask you, this is a, a point of reflection. Paul warns us to examine our hearts. This is a a moment of reflection. What do you hope in to save you? What do you believe the Lord is going to look at in your life and say, enter into my peace. Enter into my presence. What is that that you are hoping in? Do you expect to get a pass to sort of skate through? Maybe a, maybe a slap on the wrist. You've avoided the big sins, and you've done a lot of good. And so you maybe get a slap on the wrist, but, but the Lord allows you to skate on in because you're American, because you're wealthy, because you're in the church, because you give, because you read, because you know, because you serve. Or do you hope in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness? Do you secretly expect God is going to go lighter on you because you're a pretty good person? Lots of people out there way worse than you. Surely he'll let me in. God shows no partiality. Apart from the blood of Christ, God is not moved. Will you be able to say, 
on that judgment day, Jesus bought me, redeemed me in his blood. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, our hope, our sustainer, our Savior, our Lord. Our only hope is to be clothed in your righteousness. Everything else is filthy rags. Help us to toss those aside the way that we would filthy rags today and trust and hope only in your righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I want to encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.